everybody, uh, and welcome to the How To Academy. Uh, my name is uh, Matthew Dancona. I'm an editor and partner at Tortoise Media, and it's my really great privilege uh, this evening to be talking to uh, somebody I've been interested in and reading for many, many years, uh, Professor Robert Reich, um, who is presently Chancellor's uh, Professor of Public Policy at uh, Berkeley. Um, and more specifically for our purposes this evening, um, uh, the author of this really excellent book, um, The System, Who Rigged It, How We Fix It. It's published by Picador. And in fact, just before we went live, we were discussing how now is a good time to read. And um, my goodness, if you, if, you, if you choose one book to read, read this book, because it explains so much about... Um, uh, although it is based in, 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 in an American analysis, it, it uh, touches on so many things that are pertinent to the way uh, democratic societies are buckling and, and experiencing difficulties and were doing so before coronavirus, although I'm sure we'll talk about the, the relevance of, of uh, Robert's ideas to the world of the, of the pandemic and post-pandemic. Uh, um, it's a really magnificent intellectual essay, but it's also... Um, a track for our times and um, calling for change and quite how contemporary I think will become apparent in our discussion. So um, Robert, let's just get straight into it. Um, the book is bookended, so to speak, uh, with references to a man called Jamie Dimon, the, the CEO and chair of J.P. Morgan Chase, an enormous bank very powerful and significant man, perhaps not a household name. Can you explain to us why you structured the book in that way? Uh, yes, uh, Matthew. First of all, let me thank you for inviting me uh, here and thank everybody who is viewing. Um, and, uh, and also acknowledge that we are in the midst of uh, some simultaneous crises, economic and pandemic, uh, and uh, crises that really go to the root of where we are as societies and how we respond as societies to the most fundamental kinds of problems. Uh, I got started on this book actually because I got a, a phone call one day in my office at Berkeley from uh, a man named Jamie Dimon, who is, uh, Matthew, as you said, he is the CEO of the largest bank in the United States, one of the biggest banks in the world called J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, he's also uh, very prominent in America. He is uh, not a Republican. He's a Democrat. That's another reason why I was interested in him. Uh, he called me uh, to complain. I had written something that he found uh, wrong, uh, that cast him in an unfavorable light. He was upset. And for about 20 minutes, he went on uh, basically yelling at me. I let him go. And finally, at the end of 20 minutes, uh, he stopped. He said, are you still there? And I said, yes, yes, I just wanted to hear you out. And then I began responding. Uh, and uh, once I got off the telephone call, I, I realized that uh, my response to him uh, really was the tip of an iceberg in terms of what I wanted to say, not just to Jamie Dimon, but to all people like him, whether they were Democrats or Republicans, liberals or conservatives, uh, regardless of their politics, uh, they were and Jamie Dimon is at the top of America in terms of wealth and power. And uh, both in Britain and in the United States, and to a slightly lesser extent in other advanced countries, uh, we have a situation in which wealth and power have gravitated to the very top. Uh, I, Jamie Dimon is, is interesting because he is not uh, somebody who is in any way a villain. He actually, uh, during his reign during his regime uh, at uh, the bank uh, has accomplished some important things. He, he talks a good game. He talks about corporate social responsibility and uh, worries about inequality, worries about the poor. Uh, he makes speeches very, very often about all of these subjects. He's the chairman as well of something called the Business Round Table, which is an organization of chief executive officers of the major biggest corporations in the United States. Uh, and uh, he got the Business Roundtable last August to issue a statement to the effect that uh, the goals and purposes of big corporations should no longer be simply uh, to maximize shareholder returns, but should be rather 
also uh, to improve the lives of all stakeholders, workers and communities. Uh, I was intrigued by this statement uh, because it so much ran uh, directly afoul in a very, very fundamentally contradictory way uh, to what Jamie Dimon and his bank and the other big corporations and their CEOs have been doing uh, these many years and what they continue to do even after they made that statement uh, right now during the coronavirus. Uh, and so I felt compelled to talk about the system. Uh, and I use the term the system as the uh, as the title of the book, for the purpose of avoiding um, either vilifying or singling out uh, for vilification any individuals. I, I wanted people to understand that Jamie Dimon is a product of the system. Uh, he's working within the system. Uh, Jamie Dimon and others like him in the new American oligarchy, and which is also partly a British oligarchy, uh, uh, they are functioning in ways that they understand to be responsible, but fundamentally are undermining our democracy and undermining our economy. It's interesting because, um, like you, I'm sure I have a pile of books on, on my desk about Trump. Um, although Trump figures, how could he not, as a, a sort of orange spectral presence in, in the pages of the book, um, and is responsible for many of the, 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 the failures and problems that you, you list. Um, this is not an ad hominem book about Trump at all. And what interested me again is, is that structural analysis that you allude to, that you are looking at the rules of the house, the casino house. And in doing that, you, you caution us against the old, um, adversarial approach of left versus right or market versus government and steer us towards seeing this kind of corporate oligarchy of our times as a serious threat to ailing democracy. Can you elaborate a bit on that analysis? Uh, well, that's, that's right. I, I don't think that uh, in the United States, Donald Trump or uh, in Britain, uh, Boris Johnson, uh, or any of the leaders so-called that we now find ourselves with uh, are the causes of many of the problems we have. I think they're the consequence, they're the culmination. Uh, they're what we get when we uh, fail to see and fail to deal with uh, 40 years of gradual loss of our democracy uh, and more and more wealth and political power that goes with wealth uh, concentrating at the very top. Uh, the theme that you mentioned uh, is very central to the book, and that is that we are trapped in a way in an old debate between the left that wants more government and the right that wants less government. Uh, and although that's not an unimportant debate, it is not the central debate of our time. The central debate of our time should be the debate between democracy and oligarchy. And I use the term oligarchy advisedly. Uh, it's a good old ancient Greek word, uh, meaning a society in which a relatively small number of people uh, have disproportionate wealth and power, uh, so much wealth and power that they basically control uh, the society. Uh, we're used to using the term oligarchy with regard to Russia, a uh, contemporary Russia, uh, but I think it's important to see that many of our societies, and I think particularly the United States, and to a slightly lesser extent, Britain, are moving toward uh, an oligarchy, an oligarchic form uh, of society, of uh, both in terms of the economy and also in terms of uh, politics. Uh, money uh, speaks louder than anything, and that money is concentrated more than ever before. Uh, and inequality and corruption uh, are symptoms of this deeper systemic problem. Uh, and just one final point, and then I'll invite another question from you. Uh, that systemic problem is not a static problem. It's getting worse and worse. It's getting worse and worse because it is a vicious cycle. You see, as wealth accumulates at the top, so does power. And that power is able to change the market itself, to reorganize the market continuously, to generate more wealth and more power at the top. 
Uh, and so you can see how this vicious cycle gets worse and worse and worse. Uh, and uh, arguably, uh, it is not sustainable. In fact, I don't think it is. So I suppose the question to ask, the obvious question in a way, um, is how did this um, come about? Because as you mentioned in the book, um, there was an extent to which post-war America, which was of course um, scarred by segregation, sexism, and all sorts of problems, nonetheless had at its heart at least um, an aspiration, uh, an ideal uh, that um, life could be become better, that you could rise to a better quality of life, that your children um, could have a better standard of living than you did. And this was a very powerful, um, a very powerful ethos, a very a binding ethos. And it, that in the last 40 years has, has been eroded into virtual nothingness with wage uh, stagnation, job insecurity, and most dramatically, the, the aftermath of the financial crisis where the financial institutions uh, really didn't pay a price for the crash. So how, how has this extraordinary moment arisen? How has it, it come about? Uh, well, I think the way to see this historically, and the way I suggest in the book, is to view the last time uh, the United States and Britain uh, and Europe overall had an oligarchy. Uh, it was the Gilded Age of the late 19th century, in which the captains of industry, called robber barons in the United States, uh, basically took over government, took over the economy. Uh, we had uh, huge inequality, great uh, and, and uh, tragic degrees of poverty, uh, corruption. Uh, and that was followed uh, by a period uh, of reform. Uh, now, it varied slightly different. It was different in different countries. Uh, some countries did succumb to fascism or communism or other isms. Uh, but Britain and the United States actually did continue to reform themselves and their economies. Uh, the 1930s, the Great Depression, World War II, also provided uh, America and Britain with a kind of reminder of the social solidarity that undergirds all of our societies or should undergird societies. So that by the time World War II ended, uh, we were well positioned to have large and expanding middle classes. Uh, now, as you said, as I write in the book, uh, it was not as if everything was perfect. Uh, Britain began the National Health Service and did begin a, a much more and robust uh, public uh, sort of social safety net uh, than the United States had. Uh, but at least there was a movement in America toward voting rights and, and civil rights and uh, widening opportunities for women. Uh, the ideals uh, that were forged in that degree of social solidarity found during the Great Depression and World War II, uh, that, those ideals uh, continued to animate American politics up until around the time of Ronald Reagan. Uh, at which point the great pe pendulum began to swing in the opposite uh, direction. And we found ourselves again in the kind of vicious cycle we find ourselves ultimately now. Uh, I think that uh, Donald Trump and, and Boris Johnson are sort of the, the end of the line. I mean, in, in terms of how bad things can get, uh, uh, I'm not suggesting that any of this uh, for shadowed the pandemic. I mean, obviously nobody could have anticipated the pandemic, but the pandemic is interesting in the sense that it highlights and, and makes stark uh, a lot of the inequalities and corruption uh, that had been growing anyway. And also Trump's uh, inaptitude, his haplessness, his, his absolute uh, bizarre uh, inability to confront any of the real problems facing this country uh, and to go off on his kind of tweetathons instead, you know, just criticizing his critics. It's, it's very interesting you raise that because it's always struck me that, that you know, that one of the definitions of a populist is that they insist there are simple answers to complex problems. And a pandemic is par excellence, a, a, you know, a complex problem. And Trump is clearly all at sea. But what's interesting too, in the light of the book, is that if anything, the arguments you make in it are more urgent than they were before the pandemic. Um, and uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the way in which the rescue package 
has actually been gained by those who understand the system? Well, the book is very much about power, and I urge readers to understand the anatomy of power uh, rather than get caught up in economic theory or political theory. Just look at where power is and how power is exercised. And you see in the pandemic, uh, in the United States, uh, big corporations uh, exercise their power to get bailed out, just as big banks exercise their power to get bailed out in the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, the big corporations, uh, not only the airlines and Boeing, uh, but also through the huge amounts of money uh, provided by the Treasury and the Federal Reserve, uh, the big corporations are getting their debts uh, canceled effectively. Uh, um, and uh, the richest people in America are getting huge tax breaks uh, that were put into tucked in, hidden inside legislation designed to provide relief uh, for regular people. Uh, nobody really noticed or saw, because it was an 800-page bill, uh, that big coronavirus $2.2 trillion bill. Nobody saw that there was buried in there uh, $130 billion for real estate investors and hedge funds uh, and, and others. Uh, time and again, uh, power dictates uh, where the money ultimately goes. Uh, and even when it came time to provide money to small businesses in the United States, rather than helping really small businesses, mom and pop operations that are still in danger of going under, many of them are already under, uh, the money went uh, instead to the big banks, $10 billion, uh, just to to, for transferring the money. They, they took no risks whatsoever. Uh, and they awarded their major customers, uh, not people who were in need and certainly not people of color. Uh, that's a part of the story as well. In the United States, racism uh, continues uh, to rear its ugly head. Uh, at this moment, we can see the results of police brutality in the United States uh, and Donald Trump's uh, efforts to pour salt on the wounds uh, by making everybody uh, more angry at each other, uh, whites again and blacks. Uh, but also we can see in the pandemic uh, that uh, very little of the money went to any businesses owned by people of color, uh, while at the same time, the disproportionate burden of illness and infection and ultimately death uh, was imposed on, burdened by uh, uh, imposed on people of color. People of color, blacks and Latinos uh, in city after city uh, were those who have succumbed most uh, to infection and death because they're the ones who um, had not had adequate health, uh, uh, access to health services beforehand. Uh, they're the ones who are crowded together very often because they are very often poor, disproportionately comprising the poor, crowded together uh, in facilities and in houses and in uh, various institutions uh, and in their own living quarters uh, that don't provide them uh, adequate protection. So again and again, we see in this pandemic, uh, Matthew, a kind of a, a sad, uh, stark realization of what I talked about in the book in terms of the system off the rails, off track. It's, it's interesting. I take this opportunity since you mentioned it um, to talk about the public health system in America and indeed whether there is one. Um, is it the case, do you think, that the pandemic might uh, nudge Biden towards a, a more progressive universalist solution to public health policy? Because after all, you know, we know he wasn't in favor of universal Medicare before, but if ever there was a, a moment where a politician could legitimately say, this is a good reason to change my mind, this is it. Absolutely. Uh, and there are some indications that Joe Biden is shifting a bit with regard to Medicare for all, universal health care. Uh, he was not in favor. Uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren were obviously the progressive candidates uh, in the primaries. Uh, but uh, Joe Biden is, is a smart enough politician to know that if he wants to win the presidency, he cannot rely solely on Donald Trump's uh, unpopularity. Uh, he's got to provide some reason for young people to get enthusiastic enough to go to the polls uh, and for uh, progressives overall 
uh, to have some reason uh, to vote. Um, you know, um, Bernie Sanders uh, in 2016 uh, did a great service in terms of putting on the table in the United States uh, a bunch of policy ideas uh, that were considered to be quite radical when he actually initiated them, but that became more acceptable, such as Medicare for all, universal health care, a single payer system. Uh, and interestingly, uh, by the time of this election, uh, many people in America find themselves uh, very, very persuaded uh, that we need universal health care, that we need uh, a kind of a much, much better safety nets. Uh, we need uh, unemployment insurance uh, for uh, everyone uh, that is uh, capable of, of rescuing people when they really do fall uh, for no reason uh, other than uh, external events. Uh, we don't even have paid sick leave in the United States, alone among 22 advanced nations. There's no paid sick leave. So when you, when you say, and I have said, uh, there's no public health system, there's no private health system to speak of, uh, it does provide Joe Biden an opportunity uh, to show progressives, show young people, that he will be a reformer. It's difficult, isn't it? Because when Elizabeth Warren, um, you know, kind of laid her cards on the table on, on Medicare for all, she was, you know, to an extent I've rarely seen a presidential contender, let alone nominee, uh, monstered uh, in the press, you know, as, uh, you know, asked for a kind of costing dollar per dollar uh, which really was extraordinary, both in its, its ferocity, but also it was way premature. I mean, this was quite early in the primary season. So it was almost as if the system you described, not in any conspiratorial sense, but in a reflexive way, was, was, was kind of responding to that. And, and exactly, I, exactly. I, I uh, and and it, 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 it happened to Bernie Sanders. Excuse me yeah. for interrupting. It happened to Bernie Sanders as well. Uh, this is where the oligarchy comes in. And, and it is not a conspiracy. Uh, it is simply a reflexive response, as you said, uh, because the major uh, media outlets, the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, the uh, major broadcast media, uh, everybody was fine with Bernie Sanders until he became the number one lead Democratic candidate to oppose uh, Donald Trump. And then everybody got very scared. When I say everybody, I'm talking about the establishment, yeah. uh, the oligarchy and all of the palace guard around the oligarchy, including the major media. Uh, and the same thing happened to Elizabeth Warren when she, she was fine. Everybody was fine with her and, and she was well regarded until she emerged as number one uh, after Bernie Sanders declined. And then uh, her policies such as Medicare for all and a wealth tax became terribly um, uh, threatening to the establishment, to the oligarchy. Uh, and reflexively, all of the media and all of the, uh, the outlets that affect public opinion uh, started to attack her and uh, take apart her plans as if they were actually pieces of legislation. Uh, no candidate ever uh, is subject to that kind of detailed uh, assault. Uh, but I think the uh, establishment, oligarchy, uh, was very, very threatened. Uh, and it wasn't until Joe Biden won the South Carolina primary that you could almost hear the sigh of relief uh, in the American establishment, in the oligarchy. I'm using those two terms interchangeably just for the sake of this, this discussion. Uh, but you could almost hear the sigh of relief because they said, oh, finally, we have somebody who is uh, not going to disrupt the power structure. I mean, you sat round the table uh, in President Clinton's cabinet with, with many uh, colleagues who I, I, I guess would fit the description of being oligarchs in your, in your book. But do you think, uh, you know, and they were, I'm sure, decent people. Do you think... Do you think they knew they were oligarchs? I mean, it's an interesting question about the role of, of, of self-delusion in all of this. Um, yes, I don't, think they, I don't think they did know it. Um, and there were a few. Uh, in the United States, the person who is typically the Secretary of the Treasury uh, comes from Wall Street. 
uh, and represents, uh, to the extent that there was an American oligarchy 40 years ago, uh, representative, uh, there is much more now. And to that extent, every Secretary of the Treasury since then has become more and more a representative of that oligarchy. But there is self-delusion. I really don't believe, because I've sat as you suggested, uh, at the same tables with these people. I've talked with them about public policy. Many are very reasonable. Uh, many of them seem to be uh, quite caring about what is going on. They, they seem quite dedicated to improving the lives of, of most Americans. And yet, when it comes to the question of wealth and power and the nexus between wealth and power, they suddenly become panicked. You can see it in their eyes and hear it in their voice. Uh, they don't want to do anything to change the power structure. Uh, and that is what I uh, talk about in the book. And that is the way in which I, I really criticize Jamie Dimon and everyone else who is in his position uh, and suggest that it's one thing to be charitable personally and to talk about corporate social responsibility uh, and to make all of these wonderful gestures. But if you're not willing uh, to acknowledge and to, if you can, attack the power structure. Now, obviously they won't because they are part of it, uh, but unless you're willing to accede and, and give up power, uh, then uh, all of your rhetorical flourishes uh, about the importance of becoming a more uh, equal uh, a society that, that treasures equal opportunity and, and equal political representation, uh, that is rubbish. Now, it's very important, I think, to say that there's a cautious optimism to the book and you refer in, 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 in a lovely phrase um, which is, I, I assume borrows from Martin Luther King to the arc of American history. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well as King said, uh, he said it, it, it bends toward justice uh, and what I mean by that is that if you take the long-term view uh, in history, you see that every time, and I've suggested this already, every time the United States has come up against uh, oligarchy, uh, there has been a reaction. Uh, and uh, it's not just the uh, time I, I mentioned that is the reaction against the robber barons and the Gilded Age, uh, but we've seen since then and before then also uh, a pendulum kind of swing. Uh, Americans don't want centralized economic and political power. Americans, uh, whatever their persuasion, uh, they don't like crony capitalism. They don't like bailouts of the big banks or uh, they don't like to think that the game is rigged uh, because Americans want to live in a society uh, that is a genuine democracy and in an economy that uh, in which prosperity is, is widely achieved and spread. Uh, but here's the Here's the issue for me, and the reason uh, I am basically positive, or at least an optimist. Uh, I see in the young people today uh, a dedication to the principles of equal opportunity and equal uh, political rights, uh, such as I haven't seen uh, in any other generation of young people, and I've been teaching for 40 years. Uh, I also see the growth in the United States of a progressive movement <clears throat> as best exemplified by the 2018 midterm elections in which you had not only the Democrats retaking the House of Representatives, yes, of course that happened, but if you look under that process and under the surface, you see a huge wave of young people, many of them women and many of them people of color becoming uh, members of Congress, taking leadership positions, uh, this is the future, Matthew, and um, anybody who doesn't see that future is not paying attention. Anybody who is wallowing in all of the, uh, the problems today is completely understandable. I mean, I, I wallow in the pandemic and the economic fallout and, and also uh, all of the problems we have with, with police uh, brutality uh, and racism. Uh, but if you just take the long-term view, both past and future, uh, I think you can come out in a much more optimistic place. In, in all this, um, do you see what's been called identity politics as playing a positive or a negative role in generating the kind of progressive unity you want to see? 
or is it more nuanced than that? Well, I think it's a little bit more nuanced than that. I think ultimately the only way you get countervailing power, the only way you build the political capacity to take power back from the oligarchy, and I dare say this is true in Britain as well as in the United States, is through a coalition that is multiracial, multiethnic, and multi-class. Uh, and uh, the, the way you get that is you, uh, you make sure that people understand their, what they have in common. Uh, now, I'm not opposed to identity politics. I, I think that it is important for people of color uh, to understand uh, and acknowledge and fight for their own rights. I think it's important for women uh, to see how they have been subjugated uh, and continue to be subjugated. I think it's important uh, for um, minorities of, of every sort uh, to demand uh, that they be listened to. But unless we come together politically, uh, organizationally, uh, strategically, uh, there is very, very little hope. Uh, one thing the oligarchy would want to do and likes to do, one way of oligarchies in history have preserved their power uh, is to get everybody else uh, to be angry with each other. Uh, so angry that they don't see where the actual power and wealth have gone. Uh, they, 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 have, uh, they fight over the crumbs. Uh, and to the extent that that's what identity politics is, a kind of a, a veiled uh, way in which the oligarchy can keep power because everybody else is, uh, is into their own identity, uh, then it, it is something of a problem. And another idea I think which I, find, I found particularly intriguing is... Uh, um, you talk about what you call the professional palace guard. I think when, when people speak of an oligarchy, there's often an assumption that what's referred to is the top 10%. No, not at all. What you're referring to is an absolutely tiny sliver of the, pop, of the American population. And then there's a large group of people, knowledge workers, media, professionals, white collar workers, and so on, who in various ways have been co-opted to the oligarchic project. It's a very, it's a very interesting, um, and persuasive argument that I think, but then you you you, you bait and switch because you, you say, look, these guys in the uh, and women in, in 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 the in the palace guard could could end up turning on the oligarchy if if given a message that you know was was understandable, palatable, and progressive and and made sense to them. Now, can, can you expand a bit on that because that seems to me an absolutely uh, you know, a really, really new and interesting way of looking at progressivism. Well, here's the, 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 the basis for that. Um, <clears throat> I'm old enough now uh, to know uh, a lot of people, uh, baby boomers who uh, came into the workforce in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, and who have lived, uh, part of them, some of them in the palace guard, they have became lawyers uh, and uh, lobbyists. Uh, they uh, became uh, economists, accountants, uh, tax preparers. Uh, they, uh, they actually spent much of their lives working directly or indirectly uh, to prop up the oligarchy because uh, that's where the money was. That's where the money came from. Uh, but they have discovered at the ends of their lives or toward the ends of their working lives, their careers, uh, how empty uh, their lives have been. Uh, not a day goes by, Matthew, that I don't talk to one of my peers uh, who directly or indirectly laments the, uh, the emptiness of, of what, they, what they did for 40 years. Uh, you know, going, being, being a lawyer, being a, being a solicitor, going through just litigation, uh, one set of moneyed interests again, an, an, another set of moneyed interests, moving money from pocket to pocket. If you're a banker, an investment banker, can you imagine uh, what that means? Uh, you might make a lot of money, not nearly uh, oligarchical money, but you might make money, uh, but you lack meaning. Uh, I think that there's a deep yearning uh, in the palace guard for meaning, for purpose, uh, for value. Uh, I think many people uh, are beginning to see how thin their lives are, uh, and they are beginning to understand that that lack of meaning, that lack of, uh, that, that sense of emptiness is directly related to uh, the, uh, 
that they are not they are not building anything. They're not contributing anything to society. Uh, I think these people are ripe uh, for uh, the possibility of joining together with progressives uh, and creating uh, a different structure of power uh, and a, a different kind of economy. Uh, they want to leave something behind. They want a legacy uh, that is not just a legacy of um, a, a worse and worse um, uh, society, a system that is actually functioning uh, uh, for just a very, very small sliver of people. Do you think, uh, Robert, that progressives need to be better messengers of better stories? Because if you, if you look at um, what happened in, with Brexit in this country in 2016 and the presidential election America in the same year. Um, the Remainers um, and the Democrats had in common, I think, um, a certain harshness, a certain aridity, um, whereas the, the Leavers in the Brexit campaign and Trump um, went way the other direction. It was all emotion. It was pure emotional resonance. Now, I'd be the last person to say that I wanted to ignore the power of reasoned argument, and you've written beautifully about that. But I wonder whether progressives have sometimes forgotten the power of narrative and whether in this particular historical moment and moving ahead, there's a way of, 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 of building a narrative that, that, that talks about the citizenship and commonality that you write about. Uh, Matthew, I, I, I think that it is possible to, not only is it possible to build a narrative and an, a narrative that is emotionally powerful, uh, but also a narrative that is true, uh, that has the virtue of, of being yeah. based in reality, based in facts. And the narrative, uh, I think, uh, is all about what's happened in our countries over the last 40 years in terms of wealth and power moving to the top and the disenfranchisement uh, of so many people. Uh, what the right has done uh, in Britain and the United States is take the frustration, anxiety, uh, the 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 upset uh, outrage that so many people have because they haven't seen their uh, salaries, their wages, their occupations improve. Uh, they're worried that their children are not going to live as well as they live. Uh, they fear that the game is rigged against them and take all of that outrage and channel it uh, toward uh, scapegoats that have absolutely nothing to do with the ultimate reason why this is going on. I mean, Brexit uh, is a good example. I mean, the, the, the problems of Britain, the fundamental problems uh, are not Europe. Uh, the fundamental problems of the United States are not immigrants. Uh, the fundamental problems uh, are, have nothing to do with uh, the, you know, with minorities or, or with Muslims or with, with blacks or, I mean, you see uh, what the right has done is it, it's, it's, it's taken real emotional ang angst uh, and it has channeled them in ways uh, that uh, just celebrate uh, in a way uh, anxiety and fear. Uh, well, there's a different way of doing that. Uh, and the different way of doing that is to say, look, your, your anxiety and fear are real, uh, but they are not based in the sources that you think they are. That your anxiety and fear have to do with the fact that over the last 40 years, uh, you and people like you uh, have lost ground while people at the very top uh, who are becoming wealthier and more powerful by the day uh, have gained huge ground to the point where your voice is no longer even heard and to the point where your work is no longer valued uh, and uh, you are on the losing end of, of, every, of every stick. Now, that doesn't mean that the people at the top are bad people, but it does mean that they have abused their power, perhaps unwittingly. Uh, but there does need to be fundamental reform of the system. And it's all about power. It's all about reallocating power from the top uh, to everybody else. That's not a, a difficult narrative. I don't think, in fact, I, I think it's an easy narrative to, uh, to uh, get across. And it's true. Uh, I think the reason some politicians don't want to do it is they don't want to alienate uh, those with great wealth and power. Um, the, I'd like to turn, Robert, if I made some of the really interesting questions in, that are uh, popping up in the feed. Um, one uh, from 
one of the attendees says, uh, thank you, Mr. Wright. What's your view of the West's increasing dependence on China for manufactured goods? And how, I guess, how does that fit in with your thesis? Well, generally speaking, I, I do not believe that the world is a zero sum game in which the only way uh, the West or Britain or the United States can succeed is to the extent that uh, other countries like China uh, don't succeed. I mean, there is, I think, uh, many, many opportunities for joint gains. Uh, with regard to manufacturing, here we've got to be a little bit careful because routine manufacturing, uh, the kind of manufacturing that is easily and will be over the next 20 years easily replaced uh, by robots and numerically controlled machine tools uh, and so on. Uh, those jobs would disappear anyway. I mean, they've gone to China. Uh, China is now moving some of them to Vietnam. Uh, that's, those aren't the kind of jobs we want. The kind of manufacturing jobs we want are at the high end. Uh, they are manufacturing engineering, design engineering. Uh, they're the kinds of things that, that require a great deal of uh, of, of, of strategic and intellectual uh, investment. Uh, and uh, so just to talk about manufacturing itself, I think misses the boat entirely. Um, Rob Hubbard asks, uh, doesn't neoliberal capitalism drive the concentration of wealth and power into the hands of the few that you describe? Does capitalism therefore need to change? And if so, how? Well, I think capitalism does have to change. Uh, but, um, you know, capitalism comes in so many different forms. Uh, China, we were just talking about, uh, China uh, calls itself a communist state, but it is capitalist in the sense of private property and contract uh, and all sorts of systems uh, involved for enabling innovators to be rewarded. Uh, there is no such thing as a non-capitalist state any longer. But the real issue is uh, how power and wealth are allocated and what the rules of the system are going to be. I'll give you an example, Matthew, uh, and, and uh, others, uh, because it's very easy to get highfalutin and, and abstract. But let me, let me come down to earth. Uh, bankruptcy in the United States. Um, the rules of bankruptcy uh, have been uh, fashioned over the last 20 years, increasingly by the big banks, uh, by the financial community so that it is no longer possible for a homeowner to reorganize their mortgage debt uh, in bankruptcy. Uh, they have to essentially liquidate. They have to uh, forfeit their homes. They've, they've got to be kicked out of their homes if they can't pay their mortgage. Uh, before that, though, it was possible uh, for uh, mortgage debt to be reorganized. And the same thing as, as former students. Um, student debt could be reorganized under bankruptcy uh, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, that is no longer the case because the financial community changed the rules of bankruptcy. Uh, or take intellectual property. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry in the United States had uh, huge success in changing the rules of intellectual property so that it is easier for patents and trademarks and copyrights to be maintained for many, many years thereby increasing the price of many drugs higher than they would be if generic manufacturers had a chance to get involved. I could go through every technical aspect of capitalism and show you how those laws and rules have been captured by increasingly by big corporations uh, and the oligarchy uh, to increase their wealth at the expense of everybody else's wealth and income. My point is that capitalism is not necessarily the problem. The problem is that the rules of capitalism have been uh, uh, taken over uh, by uh, people who, and institutions that are enormously wealthy uh, and enormously powerful. Uh, what we've we got to do is get back to a capitalism that is not only more humane, but a capitalism that is more responsive to the needs of average working people. Robert, a, 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 a very topical and pointed question inspired by the terrible images we've been seeing on our screens in the last couple of nights. Um, it, the, the attendee asks, in the US with the events of the past week, the narrative regarding race 
and how it plays into struggles of power seems to have shifted to a belief that the only way those struggles will be resolved is through violence, i.e. in Minnesota, the response to the police brutality. Is there any alternative approach to resolving these imbalances of power? History seems to be on the side that believe armed resolution is inevitable. So how, how, do, we, how do we escape that, uh, if, if indeed we can, that, that conclusion? Well, actually, history uh, shows that some of the biggest, um, some of the most important progress along racial lines uh, have been through nonviolence. Uh, that is what Martin Luther King Jr. accomplished. That's why we have, uh, we, we, we passed in 1964 the Voting the Civil Rights Act and then 1965 a Voting Rights Act. Uh, uh, nonviolence uh, is actually much more powerful uh, and nonviolent action civil disobedience organized around nonviolence is, is enormously powerful. Uh, violent responses uh, tend to invite uh, violent responses. Uh, that is um, what's going on in Minneapolis and some other cities in the United States now uh, legitimizes and entitles uh, Donald Trump to mobilize uh, his white followers uh, through not so subtle coded language uh, to either be violent in response or to support police violence against demonstrators. Uh, that is uh, the ugliest side uh, of racism, and it doesn't mean any progress. It doesn't lead uh, to progress. It, it leads to festering, uh, deepening uh, divisions. Again, uh, Matthew, if I can put this in the context of what we've been talking about, uh, the oligarchy uh, in our countries is not racist per se, but the oligarchy is willing to allow uh, a kind of xenophobic, racist, uh, misogynist uh, uh, uprisings from time to time uh, because it helps keep people's attention away from where power and wealth really are. Uh, and it just continues uh, to, you know, to, to aggravate divisions in our societies. A, a very germane question from Peter D, which I think a lot of us have been asking um, uh, when thinking about the, the, the future after the pandemic. And he asks, um, if the oligarchy is obscured and subverted, question of climate and eco ecological crisis, have we actually passed the tipping point where any uh, miraculous reclaiming of power will have any effect in avoiding disaster? Do you have any hope to offer? Well, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't no, uh, I don't believe we have, uh, but, but I also worry about the kind of analysis that suggests uh, that every, anything is hopeless, that we've passed a tipping point, that we can't do anything. Uh, that also tends to be a work avoidance mechanism, uh, massively assumed. Well, uh, you know, the oligarchy is there, they have all the power, they have the wealth, we can't do anything. The climate crisis is, is just uh, now beyond us, uh, we can't do anything. Uh, that is an excuse for doing nothing, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, no, of course we can do more. We can not only mitigate uh, the climate crisis, we have to, uh, but we can also provide avenues of adaptation so that the crisis doesn't fall disproportionately on the poor and on the vulnerable. Uh, Michelle asks, if... Um... Sorry, I'm just, uh, if Western countries redistribute power away from oligarchies, will oligarchic countries such as China, Russia, and others gain power more easily against the West? Well, no, I think oligarchies actually are inherently unstable uh, because they must continuously reassure uh, the mass of people uh, of the justice and wisdom and appropriateness of, of the oligarchy, or uh, distract people uh, with, uh, with wars, with uh, internal uh, uh, kind of uh, dissent, uh, with uh, all sorts of, uh, of, of, of violence and nonviolent uh, kind of conflict. Uh, oligarchs historically uh, are uh, constantly trying uh, to maintain themselves by uh, essentially hoodwinking uh, uh, other people. Uh, the most stable societies are societies in which uh, people believe uh, that the system is right and just, not rigged against them. Uh, people accept change uh, and people work cooperatively uh, when there are crises like a pandemic. Uh, 
uh, when they feel that the system essentially is on their side. Uh, oligarchies are very dangerous, not to other countries, not to other civilizations. Oligarchies are most dangerous to themselves. Uh, ben Longworth asks a, a very good question. Robert, you've spent a lot of time diagnosing very elegantly the problem with the current political and economic system and the oligarchical power structures that support it. I'd be very interested to hear more about what you believe a better, more progressive society would look like. How would power be reallocated exactly? Thank you. Uh, well, um, the, the, the common response to that is to look at uh, the Nordic countries. Uh, but I think it's important for uh, the United States and for Britain uh, to look closer to home. Uh, and I don't mean in the case of the United States, Canada, although you certainly can look at Canada. Uh, I think it's important to look to the period between 1946 and 1978, a period in which in both of our countries, uh, middle classes were growing, oligarchies were actually declining in power. They had already declined in power through the 1930s and 40s, but by the time uh, of uh, that 30-year span from 46 to 76, 78, uh, you had oligarchies in retreat, uh, you had middle classes growing, uh, you had upward mobility uh, as we had not seen in our countries uh, in, in many, many uh, years. In fact, uh, I dare say uh, in Britain and the United States probably didn't have ever uh, the degree of upward mobility we saw in that period of time. And so we say to ourselves, I think we should say, what did we do right? Uh, what were the conditions conducive to a growing and prosperous middle class that was reforming itself uh, to become even more inclusive uh, during those three decades? Uh, why did we turn around? Uh, what was the what was the factor that caused us? What were the factors that caused us to move backward to oligarchy? Uh, can we capture what we did right and avoid what we did wrong? A question from Courtney, which I think um, a lot of people will have asked in one shape or form, um, which is how much is the media to blame for being too much in bed with capitalist owners and failing to bring more democratic ideas to the debate? Uh, well, uh, the media uh, really is simply a reflection to a large extent uh, of what uh, all of us want to read and see and hear. Um, I, I think, you know, Rupert Murdoch obviously can be criticized. I think there are oligarchs uh, behind the media uh, manipulating to some extent what we hear and see and watch. Uh, but uh, I think that there is, uh, if there's a problem, the real problem is sensationalism. That is, uh, the media, news, uh, current events have become a form of entertainment. Uh, Donald Trump is, uh, is schooled in reality television. Donald Trump does not do anything. I mean, as a president, he doesn't manage anything. He doesn't organize anything. He doesn't run anything. He tweets. I mean, Donald Trump plays golf uh, and he watches television and he tweets. Uh, he's not a president. Uh, and I, I think the media have, have been seduced uh, by him and the public has been seduced into his form of entertainment, reality television. Uh, it's very important that we have a serious media. It's interesting, um, uh, you quote Galbraith in the book on countervailing powers, and Shenaz Chotsi comes in with a question relevant to that, which is, how does one change the rules of the system when there is no balance of power anymore? Um, labor unions barely exist, consumers are not organized as a group. How does one bring diverse progressive groups together? Uh, well, the, the actual sequence is, first of all, you bring diverse progressive groups together around a common vision, a common narrative, a common understanding, and we've talked about that so far. And then you bring them together in a way that gives them political strategy and political purpose. Uh, it's not enough just for people to demonstrate. Uh, there has got to be a political strategy behind. Uh, and it's through that coalition that you develop countervailing power. Uh, in other words, you can't just snap your fingers and get more people into trade unions because the rules are now biased against uh, the easy formation of trade unions. It's very hard in the United States. If you want to form a union, you, you're likely to lose your job, uh, which is technically a violation in the United States of the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, but given the allocation of power, uh, it, uh, it goes without, without comment. It, it's, it's, a, it's a toothless 
a tiger that is the National Labor Relations Act uh, and the National Labor Relations Board of the United States, uh, what you have to do is have enough power uh, to demand and get changes in labor laws, for example, uh, changes in antitrust laws, for example, that takes on Amazon and, and Google and some of the titans uh, that are uh, draining uh, the entire retail segment of our economy uh, and draining advertising dollars uh, toward them. Uh, but, but again, I want to emphasize the sequence is first of all having a narrative that is powerful and compelling. Using that narrative to organize and join together a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, uh, multi-class uh, coalition capable of becoming a countervailing power in its own right. Uh, there is no other alternative. Robert, we're approaching the end of the hour and I want to sort of um, exercise my prerogative um, to, to ask the final question, which is how much is at stake in this election? Um, you know, there is, there is a, a school of thought that the Republic has a sufficiently strong constitution and, as it were, ethical software to withstand the second term of Trump. And there are others who feel that, that actually uh, uh, another four years of this man in the White House would have um, tectonic consequences. Where, where, do you, where do you stand on that? Uh, well, I, I worry, uh, obviously, if he does get another four years, uh, the damage he has done in terms of divisiveness, attack on democratic institutions, uh, the kind of problems that are not being addressed, uh, such as climate change and poverty and inequality and corruption. Uh, I worry about all of that, obviously. Uh, I worry about him putting more uh, radical right uh, justices on the Supreme Court and judges into the judiciary. Uh, it's, those are real, real concerns. Uh, but my deepest concern actually has to do with social distrust. Uh, uh, you mentioned the norms, I think our countries really do depend on a high degree of trust of our basic institutions. Uh, if you lose that trust, and we are in the process of losing that trust, uh, then you, what do you have? You, you, you really don't have any uh, fortification against demagoguery, uh, such as Boris Johnson and Donald Trump. Uh, you don't have the capacity uh, in your society uh, to stop uh, demagogues from doing even more mischief. Uh, that's what worries me. That, that's a, a, a facet of the vicious cycle that has been set in motion. Uh, Robert, we said we'd let you go at 7.30 on the dot. Uh, I just want to uh, thank you very much. I also urge everyone to buy this book. It really is, it's, it's one of my uh, favorite books of recent years. I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, it's published by Picador. Get yourself a copy, it really is superb. Um, and thank you all very much for coming and for your questions. Um, we can't clap, Robert, because of the strange rules of the virtual universe, but uh, let's wave him a, a cheery goodbye and I wish you all a very good weekend. Thank you again, Robert. Thank you, Matthew. Bye-bye. <laughs>